Hello Internet, Oscar Lee's again, this time with a video on hybrid roof finding. This will be longer than my usual videos because I'll be covering three separate topics. Decker's method, inverse quadratic interpolation, and Brent's method. First, let's review secant method. If we start with two points, we draw the secant between them. Where it intersects the x-axis is our new point x3. Now we'll use our last two points, x2 and x3, to draw another secant. This one also intersects the x-axis at x4. Now using x4 and x3, we draw another secant, and this one doesn't intersect the x-axis. So this is one of the problems with secant method. We can diverge or divide by zero. In bisection, we're given two points, a and b, where the function has different signs at those points. We can put the midpoint c, which is a plus b over 2, and test its sign. Whichever one it matches, we use that for our new a and b, and we repeat the process with the new c. We went over secant method and bisection just because Decker's method uses both of them. It was first published in Finding a Zero by Means of Successive Linear Interpolation in 1969 in Constructive Aspects of the Fundamental Theorems of Algebra. It also includes example code in Algol. Here's my copy from the library and I was only the second person to check it out. Unfortunately, that paper is not really available online, but Decker did write another paper where he described his method. He published it in 1975, and I'll put a link to it in the video description. I also slightly changed the variable names from the way he used them. The big idea behind Decker's method is that we know that secant method is pretty fast, on the order of 1.618, but it can diverge or divide by zero. And we know that bisection will converge, but it's pretty slow. So what it tries to do is use the secant method, and then switch to bisection when it needs to. Like bisection, Decker's method uses an interval, a and b, where the sine of f of a does not match the sine of f of b. If for whatever reason f of a is less than f of b in absolute value, then we'll swap them because we want to keep b as the better choice. The variable c we'll use as the last value of b. Initially, we'll start it as a. Then we compute the midpoint, m, and then we also try to compute the secant intercept, s, using b and c. If we end up dividing by zero, then s will just be m. Afterwards, we'll update a, b, and c. I'll talk about how to do this right now. Then we repeat the process until the absolute value of b minus a is less than some epsilon. Here is what that looks like visually. We have an interval a and b that contains a root since our function has different signs at those points. The value c is the last value of b, but since we're starting, it's initially a. We compute the secant using b and c, our midpoint between a and b, and then we update a, b, and c. Let's talk about how to do this right now. Let's use this number line. Remember that b is our better guess, meaning that f of a is larger than f of b in absolute value, and that c is our old value of b, meaning we expect f of b to be smaller than f of c. Our new b will be dependent on where s falls on this number line. It could be here, here, or even there. Our first case is that s is between m and b, meaning it's somewhere here or somewhere here. Recall that we can swap a and b depending on which one is better. When this is the case, we do secant method. Our new b will be the value of s. Otherwise, s is not between m and b, and when this happens, we use bisection. We make our new b the value of m. And then regardless, we update our c to be the old value of b, and then we check the sign of our function at our new b against the sign of the function at a. If they're the same, then we make a our old b. Otherwise, we keep a as itself. Let's go back to our example. Here, s is between m and b. This is our first case, so we use secant method and update the value of b to be the value of s. Then regardless, we make our new c the old value of b. Now we have to check signs. If the sign of our function at a matches the sign of our function at our new b, this means that a and b no longer contains our root, so we update the value of a to be the old value of b. Afterwards, we start the process all over. Let's look at this same example numerically. Given our same function, x cubed minus x squared minus x minus 1, we'll pick the starting points of 1 and 2, and we'll use an epsilon of 10 to the minus 7. Here's what our first iteration is going to look like. a and b are the interval points. c is the old value of b, initially it's a. m is simply a plus b over 2. s is our secant intercept. And f of a and f of b have different signs. Our new b is going to be either s or m, depending on our cases. After a few iterations, b minus a is less than some epsilon, in this case 10 to the minus 7, in absolute value. 
Therefore, our last B is our final answer. There is one more property of Decker's method, which is a tolerance check. It makes sure that you don't encounter roundoff error, underflow, or overflow. My example code was written in Haskell using rational data types. So if you use my example, you don't have to really worry about tolerance. Published alongside Decker's original paper was another paper called Remarks on the Paper by Decker. It was written by George Forsyth, explaining the reasons why he enjoyed using Decker's method. First, it makes no assumptions about the smoothness of F. The method is at least as good as bisection. And for functions that are smooth, Decker's enjoys the same fast convergence properties of seeking method. And this is me paraphrasing here, but it also doesn't have the same dangers as seeking method when there are multiple routes that seeking method has to choose from. He finishes by saying that the algorithm is as safe and effective. It is also rather subtle and merits careful study. A note on George Forsyth. He was the founder of Stanford's computer science department. And when he died in 1972, Don Knuth wrote a very moving and heartfelt article about him in communications which I recommend you read. He advised 17 PhD students. One of them was Cleve Moeller, the creator of MATLAB, and he also has a blog on the MathWorks called Cleve's Corner. Another was Richard Pierce Brent, the creator of Brent's method. Brent's method builds heavily on the work by Decker, which is sometimes why it's called the Brent-Decker method. It was first published in An Algorithm with Guaranteed Convergence for Finding a Zero of a Function in the Computer Journal in 1971, which you can read online. He also published it in a book, Algorithms for Minimization Without Derivatives, in 1973, which includes Algol examples as well. This is my university's copy of that book, which has been checked out a lot more than the other book. In the preface, he thanks George Forsyth twice. What Brent's method tries to do is to interpolate using a parabola, and if that fails, it tries to use Seekin method, otherwise it falls back on bisection. The parabola that it uses is different from that of Muller's method because the roots of Muller's method can be imaginary. It instead uses inverse quadratic interpolation. The inverse quadratic interpolation, which I'll refer to as simply IQI, is really only used with Brent's method. Let's try to create a parabola that goes through these points. To create a parabola, we need three points, and we'll use the points 0, 1, and 2. We also need the function at those points, and we'll simply plug them in. Then we use the Lagrange polynomial. I recommend watching my video on Lagrange polynomials and simply plug our values into it. We simplify and we come up with this equation, 2x squared minus 3x minus 1. That function looks like this and it goes to the same points that we started with. The trouble is this function has two x-intercepts and the roots can be imaginary. The solution is to create a sideways quadratic. So we use the same three points, and for simplicity, I'll simply call them y1 and y2 instead of the function at x1. And in our Lagrange polynomial, we'll swap our x's for our y's. So now our function looks like this. We plug our values into it and simplify, we get 2y squared over 3 plus y plus 1 third. That function looks like this. Notice it goes to the same three points and only intersects the x-axis at one point. We'll call this point x4. But how do we find this point? Given our Lagrange polynomial, we want to find the x-intercept, which means we want to find where y is equal to 0. So we'll take our Lagrange polynomial and simply plug in 0. This gives us our x-intercept of 1 third. Then we compute a new Lagrange polynomial and repeat the process until the function at that new point is less than some epsilon, an absolute value. And we can also simplify our equations so we don't have to come up with a new Lagrange polynomial every time. So given our function for a Lagrange polynomial of y, We'll generalize things in terms of n. We care where y is equal to 0, so we'll simply plug in 0. This will give us our new x point. We can simplify this equation now to remove the y, and all we have now are just simply constants to give us our new x value. IQI is not perfect, though. It is very unreliable. If there are two y's that are the same, the function will fail. And if you look at our earlier example of x cubed minus x squared minus 1, and an epsilon 10 to the minus 7, if we start at the points 0, 1, and 2, it takes 19 iterations to find the root. You have to start close. In this case, we'll start at 1, 1.5, and, and 2. Now it only needs 5 iterations to find the root. It is very finicky like this. That's why it's only ever used safely as part of Brent's method. Let's talk about Brent's method for real now. 
Brandt's method uses the same A, B, C, and midpoints that Decker uses. It tries to compute a different S though, first using IQI with the points A, B, and C. This will fail in the first iteration because we only have two points when we start, A and B. Remember that C is our initially A. So when it fails, it tries to compute the secant intercept using B and C. And if that also fails, then it falls back on bisection. Then we update our A, B, and C points, only now our test for S is between B and 3 times A plus B over 4. This gives us a little bit more room for the inverse quadratic. Then we repeat the process until B minus A is less than some epsilon, the same as Decker's method, only now we add another condition. If F of B or S is equal to 0, we'll stop. This saves us a lot of iterations. There's also logic similar to Decker's to handle Randolph error. And for most cases, this is really all you need for Brent's method, but Brent's goes one step further. It also handles ill-behaved functions by adding another variable, d, which is the previous value of c. This extra step is to force a bisection when it is behaving badly. If our last iteration was bisection, we'll check our current step, which is between s and b, and it should be less than half of b minus c, which was our last step. If it is, then we'll do our normal interpolation test. Otherwise, we'll force a bisection. This is because bisection would give us a better step than our current step between S and B. There's one more check, which is if we used secant method or inverse quadratic in our last iteration, we'll check our current step size against the second to last step we took. If this passes this uh, test, well, they'll go ahead and interpolate like normal. Otherwise, we'll force a bisection. This is intuitively trying to say, if our interpolation is giving us very small steps, then it's better to do a bisection. Let's compare all the methods that we've talked about in this video. First, bisection took the longest amount of time at 24 iterations compared to secant's six iterations. Decker's took one more than secant, but this is because it has a different end condition. It stops when b minus a is less than some epsilon. Inverse quadratic interpolation only took five iterations, but again, it has a tendency to fail. We also needed a third point. And Brent's method would have taken the same length as inverse quadratic, Except, recall again, the first iteration only has two starting points, so it can't use the inverse quadratic. Let's talk about the all-important order. Decker's method is as fast as secant method when the function is well-behaved. And IQI is as fast as Muller's method when it works. Brent's method is as fast as IQI and secant method when we're close and the function is also well-behaved. But we can simply refer to both Decker's and Brent's method as superlinear, meaning they are faster than linear. I'll leave you with a quote from Brent's book saying, our algorithm appears to be at least as fast as Decker's on well-behaved functions, and unlike Decker's, it is guaranteed to converge in a reasonable number of steps for any function, meaning ill-behaved functions too. Some final notes. MATLAB's F0 function actually uses Brent's method, and Cleve Muller has a very detailed description on how F0 works and all of the MATLAB behind it on his blog. Links to all the papers I talked about will be in the description box below the video. Forsyth and Moeller wrote a book called Computer Methods for Mathematical Computations, published after Forsyth passed, which includes example Fortran of Brent's method. And this has been a really interesting journey, reading up on the history of Decker, Forsyth, Moeller, and Brent, and to see the impact they've had on mathematics. The example code that I use will be hosted on GitHub. As always, thank you for watching. This was a challenging video to make, and I got help from my reference librarian. If you haven't already, make friends with the librarian. They're very helpful. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future videos, please be sure to leave them in the comments.